Good morning, everybody. I hope you're having a good day so far. Today we are in chapters 19 and 20. And uh, yesterday we read those two chapters. Today we're going to pull a few lessons from those chapters. And these are the messages that God sent to Egypt through Isaiah, or discussed Egypt uh, through Isaiah. And there's a few different things that I want to pull out of these particular messages. Uh, the first one is that when you start in the beginning of chapter 19, uh, God's message to the people of Egypt is that Egypt is going to struggle not from the outside, at least initially, uh, their problems are going to come from within. He says in verse 1 that uh, the idols of Egypt will totter at his presence, speaking of the Lord. The heart of Egypt will melt in its midst. I will set Egyptians against Egyptians. Everyone will fight against his brother and everyone against his neighbor, city against city, kingdom against kingdom. The spirit of Egypt will fail in its midst. Here you have a situation where not all kingdoms that fall are going to fall from outside, but rather there is going to be great destruction and great upheaval within the Egyptian kingdom from the inside. Now, we recognize that this is not the first time Egypt has been derailed because of idolatry and because of their gods. Obviously, we can look back to the time of Moses and the children of Israel and uh, see the very same issues taking place because of the things that they do and, and the way that they work. Uh, but here we have a situation where Egypt is going to fail from the inside out instead of from the outside in. And it's going to impact every facet of their society. You drop down to verses 6 and 7, and it's going to affect their crops. It's going to affect their, uh, their way of life coming off of the Nile River. And all of these various aspects are going to be impacted by the situation that is going to arise within Egypt. And so you have in chapter 19 the questioning of the Egyptians' uh, loyalty within their own kingdom, but also of their strength and their might, because God is going to uh, bring judgment upon them from an internal measure. The second lesson that I want to pull from chapter 19 is found down in verse 11, where it says, Surely the princes of Zoan are fools. Pharaoh's wise counselors give foolish counsel. How do you say to Pharaoh, I am the son of the wise, the son of ancient kings? Where are they? Where are your wise men? Let them tell you now, and let them know what the Lord of hosts has proposed against Egypt. He's going to go on in this vein for a few more verses, but the point that I want to make and the lesson that God's trying to teach the Egyptians is be careful where you get your counsel. Be careful where you get your messages, because not all counsel is good and not all of it is created equal. They have gone to their mediums, they have gone to their sorcerers and to their wise men for advice on what's going to happen and how best to handle it. And God says, these people are fools. These people don't know what is going on. These people cannot tell you what it is you need to do. And they are going to lead you in the wrong direction. There's a lesson there for us. You know, a lot of times we get caught uh, seeking advice in the wrong places. We get caught looking for people to assist us in our decision making and helping us to be able to make the choices that we need to make. But sometimes we aren't looking in the right places. We're looking to friends or we're looking to those who will tell us what we want to hear instead of looking to God and looking to his word to find out what choices we need to make. They have the same situation here. They're not willing to look to God, but instead they are looking to one another. And they're not coming out with the right answers, God tells them. And so we need to understand that we have to go to the right sources 
if we are going to be able to come out with the right answers. The last thing that I want to pull from these sections, and, and there's a number of other things we could pull, but I want to actually pull a historical element out of chapter 20. When you come into chapter 20, you find, beginning in verse 1, that this is one of the few passages that actually has a date that is given with it. It says, In the year that Tartan came to Ashdod, when Sargon, the king of Assyria, sent him, and he fought against Ashdod and took it, at the same time the Lord spoke by Isaiah the son of Amos. So, this is dated, the things of chapter 20 are dated to a certain time. And it is in the year that Tartan came to Ashdod when Sargon, the king of Assyria, sent him, and he fought against Ashdod and took it, which is all well and good and wonderful if you know who Tartan and Sargon and where Ashdod is. And we do. Uh, Ashdod is one of the principal cities of the Philistines. As a matter of fact, it is often considered the greatest city of the Philistines. And this particular event that is being talked about is one we know a great deal about historically and from archaeology. It takes place in about 711 BC, between 713 and 711, depending upon who you're looking at as far as the dates are concerned. Uh, and Sargon is the king of Assyria. Now, if you notice, that date between 713 and 711 is about 10 years after uh, the Assyrians have taken over the northern kingdom of Israel. So the northern kingdom of Israel has already gone into captivity when these things take place. And now Sargon is sending Tartan, who is his commander, he is sending him with an army against the city of Ashdod uh, further to the southwest from where the northern kingdom is. And it happens to be that Ashdod is not too terribly distant from the land of Egypt. You're actually getting close to Egypt's borders uh, at the time that this is taking place. And so when you look at chapter 20, we know that the events of chapter 20 take place around 713 to 711 B.C., which also is going to paint that picture that, that Isaiah is going to give. Uh, it's going to be, in all likelihood, significantly later than some of the things that we read about, even pertaining to Cush in uh, chapter 18, because Cush is going to be mentioned here again in chapter 20 with Ethiopia. Ethiopia and Cush are kind of the same, uh, the same area based on some of the things that I'm reading. And so you have reference to them about watching what is going to transpire with Assyria and Israel in chapter 18, and then you have these statements in chapter 20. Well, we need to recognize there's at least 10 years between the statements of chapter 18, because Israel has not fallen yet with the statements of chapter 18, and Israel has fallen at the time of the statements in chapter 20. And so there is a time frame difference between the identifying markers in chapter 18 and 20 that we've got to recognize. Otherwise, it looks like he's saying one thing in one place and then the exact opposite thing in a couple chapters later. And he is. But they're also separated by a number of years. So I wanted to be sure that we mentioned that and uh, got that kind of pulled out of there. Uh, we could take some more time and talk about uh, Isaiah's uh, visual example, which is definitely one that is uh, is worth paying attention to and caused others to pay attention to. Uh, and we could talk about some of the other things around, but our time is up for today. And uh, I think there's a lot of good things to pull out of here. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Uh, I don't guarantee that I will always have the answers but uh, I will do my best to get back to them. And so hope that you have a good day. We will pick up with chapter 21 tomorrow. Thanks.